Jimmy takes the stand. Sir, you pled guilty in 2013 to charges arising out of the operation of a highly sophisticated marijuana sales operation unprecedented in scale, correct? Yeah, that's right. And you were responsible for smuggling over $1 billion worth of narcotics and weapons, including more than 220,000 pounds of marijuana and over 182 pounds of cocaine and tens of thousands of molly pills, right? He says, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but yeah. Okay, so how did we get here? Well, we'll get to that. But first, I want to say welcome to the first episode of the Trap Tree series. This series will cover well-known and some not well-known stories from the illegal cannabis market. Subscribe, comment, smash that like button, and share this video if you would be so kind. Much love. Meet Jimmy Cornoyer. Originally from Quebec, Canada, this French Canadian was considered to be the biggest weed dealer in New York City history. Born October 1979, Jimmy Cornoyer would grow up to build a massive, some say multi-billion dollar international drug trafficking empire that involved the Hells Angels, the Sinaloa Cartel, Native American smugglers, and the Rizzuto and Bonanno crime families. At his peak, Jimmy was known for his lavish lifestyle, which included dating lingerie models and partying with Hollywood actor Leonardo DiCaprio and befriend befriending UFC legends like George St. Pierre. Stephen L. Tesconi, a federal prosecutor in New York who worked on the case that convicted Jimmy Cornoyer, quote said, we never saw anything like this guy before. In terms of his longevity and scope and the connections he had around the world, Nothing, nobody comes close. But let's start at the beginning. Jimmy Cornoyer has been labeled as a seasoned trafficker. In 1997, at age 18, Jimmy and his brother Joey were arrested for growing 11 cannabis plants. In 1998, Jimmy pleaded guilty for that case and was sentenced to just probation. Two years later, in the year 2000, he was caught selling weed out of his Jeep at the Kanesataki Mohawk res Reservation, but was able to plead guilty and avoid a serious prison sentence. Yes, Canada has a much less harsh prison sentencing uh, than the US. Now, one year later, Jimmy was arrested a third time, and on this occasion was a little bit more serious. Jimmy Cornoyer checked into a Hilton hotel in Toronto to meet with a buyer who was going to purchase 10,000 ecstasy pills from Jimmy for $65,000. The customer ended up being an undercover cop. Jimmy attempted to flee, but was captured. Court papers say during this attempt to flee, he brandished a handgun with armor piercing bullets. He served a short sentence in prison, but this third arrest taught him an extremely important lesson, which was the importance of creating layers in his drug distribution endeavor. Basically meaning, never being the person that physically touches the drugs. So he set off to recruit personnel that could help him expand his distribution network and that would also keep him insulated from law enforcement. In the early 2000s, he sent one of his most trusted lieutenants, Mario Fasin, to the US to organize and set up the East Coast Distribution Network. At this time, Jimmy Cornwallier was sending thousands of pounds of kush to the US by a sprawling operation that moved from fields and factories in Western Canada, around Vancouver, BC, through staging plants in suburban Montreal, across the United States border at an Indian reservation, and finally south to a network of distributors in New York. Mario Fasin was sent by Jimmy to make sure the operation on the East Coast would continue to run smoothly. The East Coast network consisted of many different cannabis wholesalers that would typically get 200 pounds to sell to smaller retailers, smaller dealers. Another one of Jimmy's top lieutenants named Patrick Payasi had one leg and was from Quebec, Canada. Patrick was integral in setting up a major deal with the Hells Angels to drive massive quantities of weed from the fields in British Columbia and greenhouse factories equipped with charcoal air filters 
and off-grid power systems across the border. Hidden beneath the tarps of tractor trailers, Patrick Paisi also helped Jimmy make contact with a network of Native American smugglers at the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation, who moved their own loads. They've been smuggling for generations across the border, south across the St. Lawrence River, which they did on small boats and during temperate months on snowmobiles in the winter. Once it was over the border, it was then distributed throughout the East Coast. Now, why did Jimmy focus on the East Coast market in the US? During the 2000s, and really pretty much to this day, slowly starting to change, the most valuable illegal cannabis markets in the US were on the East Coast and obviously in the Southeast of the country. The West Coast had a plethora of their own cannabis cultivation, so the value in the illegal market on the West Coast was far less valuable. Millions of dollars were being made in Jimmy Cornwallis' East Coast cannabis distribution outfit, but as many multi-regional or international traffickers know, drug traffickers, regardless of the drug being sold, typically one of the most difficult components of the illegal drug trade cycle is the last component, which is safely transporting the money back and or laundering it. Now, the explosion of the U.S. cocaine trade in the 1980s and the billions of dollars generated from traffickers like Pablo Escobar showcased this problem of transporting large volumes of cash back into the country the drugs originated from. In the case for Pablo Escobar being the country of Colombia, right, the volume of cocaine that was smuggled into the U.S. would create a far greater volume of cash. right? The literal size of a brick of cocaine was far smaller than the size of the amount of money that was generated from that brick. So what we can take away from that understanding is large amounts of cocaine is far easier to transport and smuggle than large amounts of cash money. And Jimmy Cornwallier understood this too. So how was the money made from Jimmy's East Coast Cannabis Distribution Network transported back to Canada? Well, it wasn't. Not exactly. And this is where Mexico's drug cartels come in. More specifically, the Sinaloa cartel. The money Jimmy Cornwallier made from cannabis was used to purchase cocaine. Right? A private jet would be chartered from New Jersey to transport the money to Southern California to purchase cocaine from the Sinaloa cartel. That cocaine was then packaged up and shipped back to Canada where it would be sold on the streets by the Rizzuto crime family of Montreal that controlled major portions of the illegal drug trade in Canada. A portion of the profits made from the cocaine trade in Canada by the Rizzuto Crown family would then be reinvested into Jimmy Cornwallier's cannabis smuggling operation. And the cycle would continue. So in a lot of ways, the illegal cannabis markets in the US helped flood Canada with cocaine and helped Mexican drug cartels. And do you think cannabis should be legalized? Well, that's for you to decide. By the mid 2000s, Jimmy Cornwallier's illegal cannabis empire was pushing regular shipments of high-grade cannabis into the United States. In 2004, Jimmy Cornwallier hit some major roadblocks. One of his top New York distributors hit a lick, stealing more than $1 million worth of marijuana. The relationship with the Hells Angels was starting to falter after Jimmy stopped using them for transporting the weed across Canada. And in that same year, Jimmy Cornwallier crashed his Porsche, killing a passenger which landed Jimmy in prison for a year. Part of that sentence also included him being forced to live in a halfway house in Montreal. While Jimmy was gone, his drug empire began to crumble. But once he was released, after his one-year sentence, he was able to rebuild his operation. Meeting with associates in Montreal subways while he was on work release from the halfway house he was staying at. Jimmy even got a job driving an elderly woman to help, uh, her medical appointments. Imagine if you found out your grandma's driver was one of the biggest illegal cannabis dealers in North America. <laughs> By 2006, Jimmy's operation was back to form and doing better than it ever had. At the height of Jimmy Cornwallier's success, he drove a Porsche Cayenne and a $2 million limited edition Bugatti Veyron. He was friends with George St. Pierre, a mixed martial arts fighter, and dated lingerie models like we mentioned earlier. 
His social circle was configured such that once on a trip to Ibiza, he attended the same party as Leonardo DiCaprio. In this picture you'll see right here, his brother is pictured with them both. Now, one day in January 2007, a disgruntled ex-girlfriend of a Queen's pot dealer walked unprompted into the district office of the Drug Enforcement Administration on Long Island. The woman told the DEA agents that the father of her child was a big-time cannabis dealer connected to a major illegal wholesale cannabis operation. And well, this started the beginning of the end for Jimmy Cornwallier. To think that the only reason why the biggest weed dealer in New York City history was operating for years and years wasn't on law enforcement's radar at all until this tip from a disgruntled baby mama came in is definitely mind-boggling. A task force of federal agents started to look into the man and began a multiple year investigation that would uncover this massive illegal cannabis distribution ring. Over the course of the next five years, this task force got individuals in Jimmy Cornwallier's network to flip and become informants. In court documents, one of the informants was quoted saying, quote, you just got to hope they never find out you said a word. Seriously, bro. The informant told federal agents that Jimmy Cornwallier kept on hand a $2 million slush fund to pay for the murder of anyone who crossed him. Now, to my knowledge, there were no murders directly connected to Jimmy Cornwallier, but who knows? In January 2012, the federal task force was able to get a Brooklyn grand jury to indict Jimmy Cornwallier on drug conspiracy charges. A flight to Mexico left Canada at 6 a.m. Among the passengers on board that day, February 16th, 2012, was Jimmy Cornwallier. Interpol flagged Jimmy's passport and Mexican immigra immigration officials wouldn't allow him to enter the country. He was brought to the U.S. and in 2013, he was sen sentenced to, in a Brooklyn courthouse to 27 years in federal prison. Jimmy Cornwallier was obviously an extremely intelligent person someone who probably could have been a CEO of a major corporation. Him and his brother grew up with no father, and as a teenager, he learned the game and took it to a whole other level. I think there's a lot to learn from this story. One major takeaway I have from researching the story is how illegal markets can be leveraged to prop up other illegal markets. In this story, cannabis-funded cocaine and cocaine funded a number of different illegal activities. An example of this, if you're interested and you don't know about it, I highly recommend you look up the Iran-Contra scandal. I think it'll make more sense if you know what I'm talking about. But I think we need to ask ourselves, how many of these illegal markets do we want to keep illegal? I think we need to ask ourselves if drugs have won the war on drugs. I think a lot of things. But that's just me.